Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I am Elizabeth Blue, an associate professor in medical genetics at the University of Washington, and it's my pleasure today to tell you about the CF Genome Project, where we are hoping to discover genetic modifiers of CF-related traits using whole genome sequencing data. I have nothing to disclose. So I will be providing an overview of the CFGP or the Cystic Fibrosis Genome Project, which includes whole genome sequencing data and harmonized phenotypes. I'm then going to provide three little vignettes of the work we've been doing behind the scenes to interrogate these data, including things like quality control. So the first is a comparison of different definitions of chronic pseudomonas infection or chronic PA. We're going to talk a little bit about the discovery of pathogenic CFTR variants that were missed by clinical sequencing. And finally, we're going to interrogate population structure within the data set and the relationship between that structure and the most common causal allele in CFTR, the FI508-DEL variant or F508-DEL. So the CFGP includes paired whole genome sequence data and harmonized phenotype data for over 5,000 persons with cystic fibrosis. The samples come from three different study sites and represent multiple studies. About a third of the sample comes from John Hopkins University, and it represents the twin and sibling study and a study of CF-related diabetes. Another third comes from the University of North Carolina, and those samples are from a study of extreme lung function phenotypes and a study of severe cystic fibrosis liver disease. And finally, the remaining samples come from the University of Washington, and they represent the epic ob study, or the Early Pseudomonas Infection Control Observational Study. In general, about half the sample is male and half is female. Most of the samples appear to have European ancestry, with 96% reported to have white race using the patient registry data supplemented by study records. And most of the, the subjects within the study are homozygous for that F508-DEL variant in CFTR. That sounds pretty uniform, uh, but each of those studies had their own ascertainment strategies and their own study designs. And so we do see substantial differences across some important variables within the CFGP. So this figure is to show you the distribution of age, essentially, uh, within the CFGP. The x-axis is the year of the birth date. So people who are younger have larger birth date values. They're shown on the right. And then the vertical axis is the density of the data. And then these three different curves are color-coded based on the site that contributed the sample. So here, what you can see is that the UW sample represents younger patients. You've got this really tight distribution on the right-hand side, um, colored blue for the University of Washington. This looks pretty different from the other two curves, although they are more similar to the samples from JHE or Johns Hopkins shown in red than they are the sample from UNC, which is shown in green. Similarly, see, we see differences in the distribution of lung function values between the different study sites. So the UNC sample includes the genetic modifier study which ascertains patients with extreme lung function values, those who had really good and really terrible lung function. And so that's why you see the green curve representing UNC is bimodal. You've got a deficit of people who have sort of average lung function values. That said, we're pleased to note that you see a similar median across the cohorts. On average, the average values are pretty similar across the study sites. We are working with the foundation uh, to make these data available to everybody in the research community. Um, these data will include individual whole genome sequence data files, along with a multi-sample VCF of genotypes called in all of the samples that passed quality control or QC. We also have derived phenotypes that are based on data from the National Cystic Fibrosis Foundation patient registry, supplemented by study records. These include things like patient demographics, BMI, CF-related diabetes and liver disease status, cystic CFTR genotype, chronic PA, and meconium ileus status, and normalized lung function values. So the website's coming soon. Um, it, it will be on cff.org. Uh, but in the meantime, you can email Catherine Tuggle at wgsrequests at cff.org if you would like more information about getting access to these data. So 
The first vignette I'm going to present is a comparison of different definitions of chronic pseudomonas or chronic PA. The details are provided in Rosenfeld et al., which is in press with the Journal of Cystic Fibrosis. So to date, there's no single gold standard definition for chronic PA. And you can define chronic PA using annualized data or encounter-based data. The encounter-based data is more granular. Um, it is expected maybe to be more robust, but it's also more limited in, in access. Um, it's only been collected more recently. So what we would like to do is we would like to have a chronic PA definition that could apply to the entire CFGP. But as you saw earlier, the age distribution is quite broad. Um, so we don't have very much encounter-based data for the entire sample. So we wanted to know um, how well do robust encounter-based definitions of chronic PA compare to those that are based on annualized data. Within the CFGP, only the epic Ops study has both encounter-based and annualized data necessary for these different definitions. And so the initial comparison is restricted to that set and that's shown on the left-hand side of this figure. These figures show Kaplan-Meier curves, which you will see in subsequent presentations. So in this case, the x-axis is the age at chronic PA, or the age that somebody was meets the chronic PA definition of interest. The vertical axis is the proportion of the sample that still does not have chronic PA. So at the very beginning, nobody has chronic PA. And as they get older, more and more individuals are diagnosed with chronic PA. The horizontal dotted line here, splits down into these little vertical lines. And that shows the age at which 50% of the sample meets each of these different definitions of chronic PA. We were really pleased to see that the green three out of four definition shown in green in the left-hand plot is really similar to the Hamlet and the Eman definitions. The green three out of four definition uses annualized data, whereas the Hamlet and the Eman definitions use encounter-based data. So that's very promising. When we apply the two annualized data-based definitions to the entire CFGP, we see a pattern that looks similar to what we saw in EPIC. The definition green two out of three requires positive cultures in two out of three consecutive years. Um, and it has a younger age um, at chronic PA. Not surprising, you don't need as much evidence for it. When compared to the green three out of four definition, which requires positive cultures in three out of four consecutive years. However, not only is the green three out of four definition more similar to the Hamlet and the Eman definitions, but we saw that it was associated with a higher proportion of sustained PA after reaching the chronic PA definition when compared to the green two out of three. So our takeaway message here is that if you need a chronic PA definition that's based on annualized data, the green three out of four definition is the way to go. It is the most similar to what you would get if you had encounter-based data. In the second vignette, um, this is focused on pathogenic variant discovery and a better understanding of variation within CFTR. This work is summarized in Rari et al., which is currently under review at the Journal of Cystic Fibrosis. So CFTR genotype information is important. Um, it influences clinical treatment of patients with cystic fibrosis. But there's a subset of patients who meet the clinical diagnosis of CF who do not have diagnostic genotypes. We wanted to see if we could solve that problem using the whole genome sequence data. Um, so this figure is a simplification of the first figure in the paper. Uh, and it summarizes the study design and the results. So first, you wanted to screen the CFGP for known CFTR variants. For those people who do not have diagnostic genotypes, we wanted to look for additional loss of function variants within CFTR. And then finally, for the entire data set, we just wanted to have a better understanding of the coding region variation within CFTR within this data set. So once we'd collected all of those variants, they were annotated using the CFTR2 criteria and the criteria from the American College of Medical Genetics to classify them as being causal, having unknown significance, or having varying clinical consequence. So in total, we identified 371 unique CFTR variants, and we annotated all of them. About three quarters of them were deemed to be causal or having vary varying clinical consequence using the CFTR2 criteria or the ACMG criteria. Among these, 
17 would not have been detected by a typical clinical sequencing protocol, uh, which usually focuses on sequencing the exons and just a little bit of the flanking regions. Among these, 12 of those variants were causal or thought to cause CF, uh, and that provides important diagnostic information for 84 carriers within the CFGP. Why weren't these seen in the clinical sequencing? A lot of these variants were um, large structural variants, which are hard to detect when you only sequence exons. And I've summarized a subset of those in the figure here. At the very top of the figure, you see a diagram of the CFTR gene, where the little boxes are different exons all in a row, and then the arrow shows the direction of transcription. And so these three different structural variants represent some of the variation that we saw. The first one at the top, um, it includes a deletion of exons two and three. And we saw that on 46 different chromosomes. The second structural variant is a little bit more complicated. It's a big duplication at the end of the, of the gene. And it actually captures a little bit of the near, neighboring gene as well. And so the duplicated exons of CFTR are shown here in red. And this little blue box represents the bit of the neighboring gene that was duplicated as well. That bit is not to scale. It is way too big to fit on the figure. Um, and finally, this third uh, variant was seen on two different chromosomes. And it's a complex event. It's a combination of a deletion and an inversion. And so this is just to give you a sense of the kind of variation that we can get um, and detect in the whole genome sequence data um, and to demonstrate that it provides important diagnostic information as well. Finally, um, this third vignette digs into the fine scale population structure within the data set. Um, this is summary, summarized in detail in Kingston et al., which is currently under review with human genetics and genomics advances. So what are we doing here? The most common CF causing variant in CFTR is F508 del. However, that variant varies in allele frequency along a geographic line in Europe. The CFGP has oversampled individuals with F508 del, which you can see because 80 something percent of the sample uh, was homozygous for it. And the concern here is have we also oversampled other variants across the genome that are associated with that geographic line? And is that going to mess up our genome scans later on when we look for modifiers? So the goal of this project was to describe the fine scale population structure within the CFGP that was correlated with the F508 del allele, um, and then also to demonstrate how to perform genome scans that control for that variation adequately. So to look into population structure, we performed principal components analysis of the genome sequencing data that passed QC. What is principal components analysis? It is a tool that digests multidimensional data into orthogonal axes of variation. So you're taking whole genomes worth of data and you're simplifying it into different axes of variation. So the first principal component is, is representing the axis of variation through that multidimensional space that explains the most of that variation. This plot on the right is a little bit, little bit complicated, but it summarizes a lot of information. So this is a comparison of principal component one, two, three, and four in a matrix form. On the diagonal, you've got a density plot again, showing the distribution of individuals by reported race and ethnicity values along that principal component axis. So here you see that the um, gold individuals are shown on the right, whereas the blue are piled up in this other corner. Um, and this variant, this principal component explains 0.78% of the variation in the genome sequencing data. Each of these scatter plots show the distribution of the participants in the CFGP along those axes of variation. And when you see clusters, that's population structure showing individuals or samples that are more genetically similar to each other. They'll clump up. So one thing I wanted you to see here is first off, the early PCs are showing population structure that looks correlated with reported race and ethnicity values. This is consistent with what you would expect to see in human genome sequence data. But interestingly, principal component three you see how it is showing variation within primarily the non-Hispanic white subset. So it's pulling out variation and showing this gradient within that sample, which reminded us a bit of the decline of F508 del. So we wanted to investigate this a little bit further. 
we performed similar principal components analysis in the CFGP subset that was non-Hispanic white. And these plots show on the x-axis the chromosomal position of a variant. And the vertical axis it is demonstrating the absolute value of the correlation between the genotype at that variant and that principal component. So what do we see? Within the CFGP non-Hispanic whites, the first principal component is driven by variation at a handful of loci, and we recognize some of them. So here shown in green is the variation near the lactase gene. Orange is the HLA region. And pink is the CFTR region. So both variation both near lactase and near HLA are known to be associated with population structure and geography within Europe. But you don't normally hear of CFTR showing up in those analyses. So we went out and we got genome sequence data from a different study that did not ascertain for cystic fibrosis um, that was representing non-Hispanic white individuals. And again, here, you see an excess of correlation at lactase again, but not at CFTR, even as you go through the next several PCs. You do eventually see a little bit of excess correlation here on chromosome eight. That's a large structural variant that is also associated with population structure within Europe. So it looks like that PC1 is tagging stuff that's related to CFTR variation, specifically within the CFGP. And we wanted to know um, what variants across the genome are associated with F508 DEL. We need to know who these are so that we can recognize them when they show up or if they show up in later GWASs, because then we would be suspicious that that GWAS didn't adequately control for the swine scale population structure. So, we performed a couple of GWASs using an outcome variable that was defined by being either heterozygous or homozygous for the F508 allele at CFTR. So the first analysis is shown at the top, and this is a genome scan, again, with that F508 DEL outcome variable. And what you see is the chromosomal position of the variant, again, on the x-axis, and the vertical axis is the minus log 10 p-value, or it's a, me a measure of strength of association between variation at that point in the genome and the F508 DEL outcome. The horizontal lines in these figures are the genome-wide significance thresholds. And what we see in this baseline model is that variation at several loci across the genome is significantly associated with F508 DEL genotype. Um, and that includes our old friend at lactase here shown in green and a very strong signal at the CFTR locus. It actually flies off the top of the figure and it's had to be truncated. But we also see evidence of genomic inflation. That's what that lambda value is in the upper right corner. Ideally, when you're doing a genome scan, you want a lambda value near one that suggests that the distribution of your test statistics that you observe is similar to what you'd expect under the null. You see values bigger than one when your study has not well controlled for population structure within your sample. So this is all bad news. However, if we include the first four principal components as covariates in the genome scan, so same analysis, we're just gonna add a couple of extra covariates. Um, all of those associations go away outside of the CFTR region. And that's what's shown in the bottom half of this figure. Again, in this case, nothing is reaching genome-wide significance and our lambda values are back near one where they should be. So this is exciting. This suggests that there is population structure within the CFGP that's related to F508 DEL genotype, but we can control for it in our studies looking for genetic modifiers. And you will see some of those studies later on in the symposium. So that was a lot <laughs> to give you in 20 minutes. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Um, you can also put questions into the chat um, and I'm happy to talk about it in the live Q&A section later. You may also be interested in going to some of our posters at this um, meeting, poster number 644 and number 654, uh, present other results from the CF Genome Project. And finally, I wanted to give you some references for the manuscripts that are either under review or are in press. And finally, I wanted to thank everybody, um, the participants, the foundation for their support, and our collaborators within the CFGP for their work on the results that I've presented here today. Thank you very much for your time.
Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak as a part of this exciting symposium. Today, I'll be talking about some of our results from the CF Genome Project on CF-related diabetes, meconium ileus, and nutritional status in CF. Twin and sibling studies have shown that each complication in individuals with CF is influenced by three factors in various degrees. CFTR genotype, or the amount of residual function the CFTR protein has, genetic modifiers or genetic variants outside of CFTR, and environmental and stochastic factors. And to better understand the role of genetic modifiers in cystic fibrosis, the CF Genome Project whole genome sequenced over 5,000 individuals with CF from five studies. And today I'm the second of three speakers who will be talking about work from the CF Genome Project within this session. And I will focus on our findings on CF-related diabetes, intestinal obstruction or meconium ileus, and nutritional status measured in body mass index. And in the, all of the analyses I'll be talking about today, in order to restrict to variation due to genetic modifiers and limit the effect of environmental factors and CFTR genotype, we excluded data after, uh, after modulator use and restricted to just those with CFTR genotypes resulting in severe CFTR dysfunction and exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So meconium ileus, which I'll refer to as MI, is the blockage of the small intestine in the newborn, as you can see here, caused by thick intestinal contents. And it must be treated immediately with enemas or surgery to prevent complications. It is a common complication of CF, with about 20% of individuals with CF being born with MI. CF-related diabetes, which I'll be referring to as CFRD, is a distinct type of diabetes with features of both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. It's generally characterized with normal insulin sensitivity, but reduced and abnormal production of insulin that declines gradually. And it develops over time and is very common. So about 10 to 15% of adolescents and 30 to 40% of adults are expected to get diabetes. And if they live long enough, we expect everyone with pancreatic insufficiency CF to develop diabetes. And it's an important complication of CF because it's correlated with worse lung function and mortality and treatment with insulin improves these outcomes. In our initial analyses, it appeared as if there might be a relationship between CFRD and MI at first glance, but it turns out this was largely explained by other confounding factors. So for example, here I'm showing you a plot that restricts to F508 del homozygotes born after 1970 to uh, account for birth cohort and CFTR genotype. In the x-axis, you can see age in years, and in the y-axis, you can see the fraction without, in the, without CFRD. And as you can see, most people don't get diabetes before age 10, but by age 30, about half of the individuals got diabetes, and by age 50, nearly 90% got diabetes. And this graph demonstrates the wide age of onset of CFRD. And in this plot, the individuals with MI are shown in blue, and the individuals without MI are shown in red. And you can see that they don't have much of a difference in their CFRD onset. And this is reflected in their log rank test p-values that statistically compare these two curves. The International CF Gene Modifier Consortium has identified and published a number of different loci that associate with CFRD and MI through genome-wide association studies and candidate-based approaches that were published in these manuscripts. And of the CFRD-associated loci, some were related to type 2 diabetes, whereas others were not. But what I wanted to highlight here was that, interestingly, so far, variants at three loci have been associated with both traits at SLC26A9, CEBPB, and PRSS1. So to evaluate the genetic, the overlap in genetic architecture between these two traits, we conducted genome-wide association studies for 
both traits, meaning that we checked for association between all common genetic variants genome-wide with each trait. We then plotted the associations of each of these variants with uh, associations of each of these variants with both traits against each other. And in this plot, each dot represents a single genetic variant and its association with MI is shown on the x-axis and association with CFRB is shown on the y-axis. And the associations are shown as log transformed p-values. So the more, the further away the variant is from zero, the more significantly it is associated with each trait. And variants that have the same direction of effect for both traits are plotted on the positive side of the x-axis, whereas variants that have opposite directions of effects are plotted on the negative side of the x-axis. And as you can see, most variants do not associate with either trait and are clustered around zero within this triangle. However, interestingly, these three variants variants at these three loci associated with MI, but have little or no evidence for association with CFRD. In contrast, variants at TCF7L2 had evidence for association with CFRD, but didn't have much evidence for association with MI. And this locus is of particular interest because these variants are also associated with type 2 diabetes. So these variants are pyotropic, meaning that they influence more than one trait. Interestingly, variants at SLC26A9 and CEBPV associated with both CFRD and MI, and the more significantly they associated with CFRD, the more significantly they associate with MI. And in addition, each of these variants were concordant in their direction of effect. The alleles that increased risk for CFRD also increased risk, increased risk for MI. The variants at PRSS1 also associate with both CFRD and MI, but were discordant in their direction of effect. The alleles that increased risk for CFRD decreased risk, or in other words, were protective for MI. I'd like to walk you through in a little bit more detail these three loci that affect both traits, and starting with PRSS1. PRSS1 encodes for cationic trypsinogen, which is converted to trypsin, a key protease secreted by the pancreas. And it's measured in the newborn screen as IRT, so you can imagine it's very important for CF. As I mentioned, the alleles that decrease risk for MI increase risk for CFRD. But interestingly, these manuscripts show that these same variants also increase risk for can chronic pancreatitis. And turns out that these variants influence the expression of PRSS1 and increase its expression. So we hypothesized that increased expression of PRSS1 could result in elevated levels of active trypsin in the intestine, improving digestion and hence decreasing risk for meconium ileus. In contrast, normally trypsin is in its inactive form in the pancreas. However, premature activation of trypsin in the pancreas due to overexpression of PRSS1 could damage pancreatic tissue and therefore could increase risk for pancreatitis and CFRD. I'm not going to show you any more data on CEBPB, but what I will say is that interestingly, these variants also associate with type two diabetes. And these variants are surrounding this gene CEBPB, which encodes for a transcription factor that interestingly has been shown to reduce beta cell mass and lower plasma insulin levels. So this might be how these variants are influencing diabetes. Variants at SLC26A9 were one of the first variants reported to modify CFRD and MI in the publications listed here. And in the CF Genome Project, we were able to confirm that these variants are associated with both traits. But in addition to that, with whole genome sequencing data, we were able to take a deeper look at this locus, which gave us more insight. And it turns out, in addition to the variants that associate with both CFRD and MI, 
there were a cluster of variants downstream of SLC26A9 that associated with CFRD, but not MI. Here are locus zoom plots for MI on the top and CFRD at the bottom. Each dot represents a single variant with the position on chromosome one across these various genes on the x-axis and the association with CFRD and MI as a log transform p-value on the y-axis. So the more significantly it associates with that phenotype, the higher up on the plot it is. The variants that were previously known to influence both traits are located in tronic and upstream of this gene, SLC26A9. And the data from the CF Genome Project revealed these variants, 260 kilobase pairs downstream of SLC26A9, which are near this gene, SLC45A3, that associated with CFRD, but not MI. And I would like to also call your attention to this other gene here, PM20D1, because I will be talking about this gene in a couple of slides. Going back to this plot, this time, the common variants downstream of SLC26A9 have been labeled in green. And as you can see here, the variants are associated with CFRD, but not meconium ileus. Interestingly, at this locus, there was also a single variant that, in contrast to the green variant, associated with meconium ileus, but not CFRD. This variant encodes for a valine to methionine change within the SLC26A9 protein. And according to a prior EM structure recently published, occurs within the transmembrane domain of SLC26A9 near the extracellular chloride binding pocket. This variant is about 1% frequency. So I would like to point out that we couldn't have found this with genotyping arrays, and we were able to detect this variant because we were working with full genome sequencing data. And I won't go into more detail on this variant, but I invite you to visit poster 654 to learn more about this variant. Based on all of this data from the CF Genome Project and also published functional data, we have a working hypothesis for how these variants at this SLC26A9 locus might be influencing CFRD and MI. Here is a diagram of a portion of the minus strand of chromosome 1 with our genes of interest SLC26A9, PM20D1, and SLC45A3 shown. And here on the right, you can see the location of the common variants that associate with CFRD and MI. V172M is the 1% frequency missense variant with, uh, within SLC26A9 that associates with MI but not CFRD. And on the left are the common variants that associate with CFRD but not MI. We hypothesize that the missense variant V172M could be altering the structure and or function of the SLC26A9 protein. In addition, prior experimental work by Gary Cutting's lab and EQTL data from the GTEx project demonstrated that the high risk alleles of the common variants upstream of SLC26A9 decreased the expression of SLC26A9. So what does SLC26A9 do? SLC26A9 is a chloride bicarbonate exchanger and chloride channel, which has been shown to interact with CFTR and is expressed in the exocrine pancreas. So we hypothesize that if SLC26A9 is not functioning properly or has insufficient levels, this could affect the digestion of interluminal content leading to meconium ileus. And potentially aberrant exocrine ductal function indirectly could result in islet cell destruction, which could contribute to reduced insulin secretion and the development of diabetes. EQTL data from GTEx also shows that common variants upstream and downstream of SLC26A9 influence the expression of PM20D1. PM20D1 was shown in a study published by Long et al. to be uh, a secreted enzyme that catalyzes the condensation of fatty acids and amino acids to generate n acyl amino acids, and also it catalyzes the reverse hydrolytic reaction. It has been shown to improve glucose homeostasis and increase energy expenditure. 
Therefore, PM20 D1 could also be playing a role in the diabetes seen in these individuals, which could explain why these CFRD associated variants, these variants are associating with CFRD, but not McCone and Elliott. To summarize what I've told you so far on genetic modifiers of CFRD and MI, common variants at PRSS1 are associated with increased risk of MI and decreased risk of CFRD and pancreatitis. Variants at CEBPB are associated with increased risk of CFRD, MI, and type 2 diabetes. Two independent groups of common variants at SLC 26A9 associated with increased risk of CFRD, and only one of these is also associated with increased risk of MI. And a rare variant within SLC 26A9 was associated with increased risk of MI, but not CFRD. I would like to take the last few minutes to talk about genetic modifiers of nutritional status in CF. I don't have time to show everything, but there are a couple of pieces of information that I thought would be useful to get across to you. We have access to longitudinal height and weight data from a number of sources for the individuals within the CF Genome Project, which we were able to normalize to the CDC reference for age and sex from 1977. And there are many ways to compile this longitudinal data, but we start with the simplest, which is a lifetime average because this single measurement could be a decent reflection of their lifetime nutrition status or propensity of being overweight uh, or underweight. When we plot out a histogram of the distribution of these lifetime average BMI Z scores, we found that this rough definition does a pretty good job. It was approximately normally distributed with a wide range of values from negative four standard deviations to plus three standard deviations. And the average was a little bit lower than zero compared to the 1977 reference, which is a little bit lighter compared to today. Twin and sibling studies have shown that this range of phenotypes is largely due to genetic modifiers and the genetic variants outside of CFTR. So we sought out to use this, the data from the CF Genome Project to identify these genetic modifiers. And to do so, similarly to what we did for CFRD and MI, we conducted a genome-wide association study for BMI Z-scores using the CF Genome Project data. And as a result of this analysis, we found a series of variants within this gene, FTO, that associate with BMI within, with genome-wide significance. Interestingly, these same variants are also associated with BMI in the general population with the same direction of effect. And it's interesting that it continues to operate in people who have CF. To conclude my talk, genome-wide and candidate-based analyses of data from the CF Genome Project identified rare and common variants which are associated with multiple non-pulmonary traits. And a deeper look at each locus can further reveal important insights into mechanisms of disease. I will end my talk here. Uh, we have far too many results to present within a symposium session, but I hope I was able to give you a hint of the types of things that you could do with whole genome sequencing data in this presentation. And I would like to acknowledge the many investigators who have contributed to the CF Genome Project. As you can see, there are far too many people to acknowledge individually, which shows how much work it takes to put together and analyze a resource like this. In addition, I would like to thank the CF Foundation for their scientific and financial support and for the CFF patient registry data they gave us access to. Finally, I would like to thank the patients, families, care providers, and clinic coordinators whom we couldn't have done this without. Hi, I'm Michael Knowles of the Pulmonary Division at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. My CF Genome Project presentation today is about trying to identify genetic variants that modify severity of cystic fibrosis lung disease. The ultimate goal is to identify genetic variants that may be a novel therapeutic target, whereby we can develop new therapeutics that are CFTR genotype agnostic. Today, I'm going to present the results 
of the analysis of common, not rare variants. It's important to recognize that the, this CF Genome Project data will be, become a resource for the CF community for future investigations. I want to call your attention to the fact that there is a poster being presented tomorrow by Yi Kui Zhou, where you may learn more details about this presentation. I'm covering a lot of ground today in 20 minutes, so there may be questions that come up, but we can address those in the question and answer session. I have no relationships to disclose for this presentation. This slide shows some data that is relevant to the concept for looking for genetic modifiers in CF. As you can see from this plot, there's enormous diversity in the FEV1, which is the most important marker for CF lung disease and CF versus age. Uh, we now know from two studies that at least 50% of this genetic variability in FEV1 relates to non-CFTR genetic variation and that it's heritable. Therefore, we have a decent chance of finding significant modifiers through this study. The other question that comes up here is how do you relate, compare lung function at age 10 to age 40 or 50, for example? Someone who is age 10 with an FEV1 of 40% predicted obviously has worse lung disease than someone who is age 40 uh, with an FEV1 of 40% predicted. So it's critical that we try to figure out a disease, quantitative lung disease phenotype. We spent a lot of time doing this over the past several years and uh, have now developed a quantitative phenotype uh, known as K-norma, which uses multiple measures of lung function over three years, corrects for survival, and it's important to know in the CF Genome Project that we only use lung function data that is pre-modulator use in CF. This violin plot shows the quantitative lung disease phenotype K-norma distribution for the five different cohorts in this study, which total a number of 7,840 patients. The Johns Hopkins cohort is a twin and sibs a cohort. UNC cohort is an extremes of phenotype enrollment where we identified patients with mild and severe disease. And the UW cohort is the EPIC observational study to define the effects of Pseudomonas aeruginosa on uh, lung disease severity. In addition, we were able to use whole genome sequencing to impute genome-wide genotypes in both the French and Toronto cohorts that were in our 2015 GWAS Nature Communication paper. And I want to give thanks to Harriet Koval and Lisa Strug for continuing this collaboration and enabling us to uh, achieve the largest number of CF patients in a lung phenotype study that's ever been presented. I want to point out that we did whole genome sequencing in the first three cohorts, which allowed imputation of the French and the Toronto data set. Uh, I do want to point out that the age range varies across these cohorts, with UNC, for example, being the oldest, age 26 at the time k norm was calculated, and the UW cohort were only age 13 at the time uh, K normal was calculated. A brief cover of the methods and analyses. We use standardized high quality whole genome sequencing with quality control, which generated millions of genetic variants. We imputed the genotypes for the Canadian and French patients using a top med, a freeze eight. And the analysis was a standard a single variant analysis of lung phenotype using meta-analysis across cohorts and platforms. This Manhattan plot shows common genetic variants or single nucleotide polymorphism SNPs, as we say, in 7,840 CF patients. As you can see, there is a plot of SNP p-values on the y-axis 
across the genome. And as you can see, there are six significant loci which uh, achieve genome-wide significance uh, above the red line. Five of these loci were identified in our previous GWAS publication, which used only a genetic panel of about 500,000 SNPs. So there's much more extensive genotype data for analysis in this study. Uh, we did identify a new locus in this study on chromosome 16, which uh, is identified by the red arrow. I'll discuss all of these loci, but I want to start with our new locus at chromosome 16. This locus zoom plot actually shows the genes and p-values associated with k norma across this region. Remi I'll remind you that the associations that we see with these SNPs do not define the mechanism whereby genetic variation may modify lung disease phenotype or tell us which SNP is the most important. The top SNPs in this association are red because they are inherited together and are in what we call linkage disequilibrium, or LD. And there's also some linkage disequilibrium with these other colored SNPs below. The top SNPs in this region are intergenic between CHP2, protein kinase, CB. CHP2 binds to a sodium hydrogen exchanger that regulates pH on airway surfaces and thereby is, could be highly relevant to CF lung disease. And protein kinase CB has multiple cellular functions such as apoptosis. I'll note that one of the genes in our, one of the SNPs in our top cluster here actually has been recently reported to be associated uh, with infection with non-tuberculous mycobacteria. So obviously there's some genetic variation in this, this region that relates to host defense mechanisms in lung disease. Back to the Manhattan plot, I call attention to three other loci with red arrows, which all have one cluster of SNPs that are related to lung disease severity. And we'll look at each of these loci uh, separately. The locus of chromosome three is fascinating because it is peak SNPs are over two membrane tethered mucins, MUC20 and MUC4. These membrane tethered mucins are present on the luminal border of airway cells and contribute to the brush border of cilia movement as well as being shed into mucus. And so both of these obviously relate to mucociliary clearance, which is an important part of CF airway disease pathophysiology. As we were analyzing this region, we found many different structural variants in this region, as has recently been reported to occur in a science article. So it's been challenging to define the mechanism of disease modification in this region. I will point out, though, that um, there is a, a relationship between the genotypes in this region and differential expression of MUC20 and MUC4. So perhaps differential expression of these mucin genes relate to the modification of lung disease severity. The locosome at chromosome 6 is at the uh, HLA class 2 locus which has been associated with more than 100 other disorders, frequently through autoimmunity. I'll call attention to the gray dots in this region, which reflect the intensive genotyping that occurs from whole genome sequencing. Even that may be challenged, however, and you may hear more about this in a presentation later from the Toronto group about how long-range sequencing they give better a genetic information across regions such as this. Note that there is a very broad signal across this region, and the genes it covers are highly polymorphic with many different allotypes for each gene. Therefore, it's very challenging to identify the specific genes and allotypes that may be responsible 
for lung disease severity in this region. Chromosome X locus is fascinating in that there have been studies that look at therapeutics uh, associated potentially with these signals here. Our session co-chair, Dr. Dara, and her associates at Case Western Reserve, Mitch Drum, and et cetera, have pursued studies of AGTR2. The angiotensin II receptor 2 is in the renin, renin angiotensin pathway, which is abnormal in CF and is involved in inf inflammation, apoptosis, and tissue repair. Dr. Dara and colleagues showed that deletion or inhibition of AGTR2 in two different mouse models improves the lung disease that's present there. So this is a potentially interesting region which has real therapeutic implications. The challenges for this region and moving forward include the fact that the cellular exact cellular mechanism is not yet defined. Plus one needs AGTR2 inhibitor that would be potentially useful in humans. Back to the Manhattan plot, I wanna call your attention to two other regions which are unique in this uh, CF genome project. Namely that each of these loci have two independent groups of SNPs that may relate to how their modification of CF lung disease may occur, or maybe through different mechanisms or even the same genes. Verifying these independent SNPs in these two loci benefited from the extensive genotyping from the whole genome sequence in this project. And uh, the analysis involved complex uh, approaches, which I will not have time to talk about today. However, I will present a slide on each locus for some discussion. The locus at chromosome five is uh, interesting in that there's a very broad array of SNPs across four genes that I've highlighted. The colored SNPs to the right of SLC9A3 comprise one uh, set of SNPs that may modify lung disease severity. And the blue SNPs to the left of SL3, 9A, SLC 9A3 or another group of SNPs that are independent, uh, have a potential independent effect. SLC 9A3 captures our attention first because it's a sodium hydrogen exchanger that may, may relate to changes in a pH of airway surface liquid and the mucociliary clearance. Plus, a Canada gene study from Canada about 10 years ago reported that SLC9A3 was associated with uh, lung disease severity and pseudomonas, uh, age of onset in CF. But there are three other genes in this region that all have similar functions that relate to cellular microtubular function and regulation, EXOC3, CEP72, and TPPP. Tom Kelly and colleagues in, at the Case Western Reserve have reported that microtubules are dysfunctional in CF, ibuprofen, a known anti-inflammatory drug in CF, and resveratrol restore microtubular function in CF cells. So this is a potentially fascinating region where microtubular uh, dysfunction may be highly relevant to pathophysiology. I will note that there is one uh, SNP in our cluster over CEP72 that's associated with FEV1 to FEC ratio, uh, which is a, a marker of obstructive lung disease. And so there will be continued mechanistic studies in this region uh, that relate to microtubular dysfunction. The final locus zoom plot we'll show today is the chromosome 11 locus, which again has two independent groups of genetic variants that may modify CF lung disease. The region that is intergenic between EHF and APIP is the top region of independent SNPs. EHF is an epithelial transcription factor 
that regulates a host of airway epithelial functions. And APIP is a, a gene that uh, inhibits cell death and is associated with uh, inflammation. Uh, the second group of SNPs are the blue SNPs over APIP. The p values are not impressive originally, but have been validated as an independent group of SNPs through a series of statistical maneuvers. The studies to date have not clearly defined the mechanism of disease modification from the SNPs in this region, although uh, there is increased expression of APIP in the methionine salvage pathway, which is associated with inflammation. And there are ongoing studies by Dr. Polanini at Kansas to pursue this mechanism and explore a therapeutic approach. Thus, the conclusions from this whole genome sequence CF genome project is that this extensive sequencing has enabled more accurate genome-wide imputation of additional subjects, allowing us to add Canadian and French patients and lead to the largest modifier study of the CF phenotype. This study also validated previously identified loci and made analyses more accurate. It enabled discovery of new biologically relevant candidate gene modifiers and allowed identification of variants to be relevant to CF lung disease. And finally, it validated the use of the quantitative lung disease phenotype across cohorts. Future directions for, from this whole genome sequence project, we will continue analyses of rare and structural variants, as well as mechanistic studies at significant loci. There's now ongoing work to establish the transcriptional effects of these genetic variants on the lung phenotype. The availability of the CF genome project data will uh, allow the use of this genome data for ongoing and future studies of variants that modify the response to modulators, a very important project that's being led by uh, Ron Gibson at UW. And finally, we're delighted that this CF genome data set will be available through the CF Foundation to aid other investigations, including imputation of the CFTR locus, which is highly enriched in this genome sequence data set. Finally, this acknowledgement slide of pays tribute to the list of the enormous number of subjects that are participating in making this project, people at uh, Hopkins Seattle, University of Washington, uh, UNC, North Carolina State, and we are indebted to the CF Foundation, which is funding this project. I include my uh, email address here so that I can be available for questions that we don't get to touch in the question and answer session. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Scott Master Mateo from the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And today I'll be presenting on high quality phased whole genome sequence across cohorts is achievable and informs phenotypic variation in cystic fibrosis. I have nothing to disclose for this presentation. And jumping right in, our previously published work with the International CFG Modifier Consortium identified many loci of interest associated with meconium milius. Here is a Manhattan plot from that work with chromosome number on the x-axis and log negative log 10 p value on the y-axis. We see many association peaks around the genome. In particular, we identified a suggestive association on chromosome seven with the trypsinogen locus, which contains genes exclusively expressed in pancreas. While MI is an intestinal disease, the trypsinogen locus is tantalizing because we know pancreas dysfunction and abnormal trypsinogen levels are very relevant to cystic fibrosis. Although the peak did not reach genome-wide significance, it's possible that complexities within this region have weakened the signal. Here we have a zoom-in plot of the trypsinogen locus. On the x-axis, we have genome position with genes annotated, and right here are the trypsinogen genes. The y-axis shows negative log 10 p-value. 
The tested SNPs are plotted along the top as vertical lines. The color denotes the R squared value to the top SNP denoted here. And the goal of this work is to use sequencing approaches to fine map this region. Uh, this plot alone motivates multiple questions though. First, we see what is potentially multiple association signals, one right here and one right here. We are interested if this is an indication of allelic heterogeneity. Next, we see a gap in the SNPs reported, and we would like to address why this happens and what impact it may have on the analysis. Finally, we are interested in the causal variation that alters MI risk and how it may impact gene expression. Focusing on the first question, we would like to know if there are multiple independent SNPs uh, with independent genetic effects in this region or if a single variation is being tagged. To assist in answering this question, it is valuable for us to have phased haplotype data to see if these, if these SNPs are coinciding on the same haplotype. Standard next generation sequencing approaches make it very easy to identify heterozygous variant sites like these. However, simply knowing which variants are heterozygous does not inform which alleles are found on the same physical DNA molecule. In this illustration, we can see A and C are found on the same chromosome, and T and G are found on the opposite one. However, flipping one of these sites is an equally valid configuration given this. Pairs of heterozygous alleles can be in cis or trans, and this dimension of data is often overlooked in sequencing studies. Phase can be extremely relevant in a disease setting, which is well known to this audience as it relates to CFTR mutations. Individuals homozygous for a single CFTR mutation will have cystic fibrosis. In the case of two different heterozygous mutations, however, disease depends on whether the mutations appear on the same or opposite chromosomes. Common methods to access phase information are based on inferring the haplotypic data from additional data sets. TRIO data can inform phase, but it requires gathering parental data and is only useful for sites where at least one parent is homozygous. This requires extra time and money to collect data outside of the target population. Reference imputation requires a, a panel of the appropriate population and is less accurate for rarer variants. Additionally, the quality of the imputation is entirely dependent on the haplotype accuracy. Phase errors in the reference panel will be imputed into the target data. Ideally, we would like to be able to do individual level phasing by direct observation of the phase in a single person. This way, there is no dependency on external data and phase can be measured directly instead of being inferred. Individual level phasing is possible using sequencing data. Consider two heterozygous variants, 60 base pairs apart. We have a CG here and a CG here. Short read sequencing data can generate reads that inform both of these sites simultaneously. In this case, we can observe the Cs are on the same chromosome and are opposite to the Gs based on these informative reads. However, limitations do exist. If two heterozygous variants are instead 60,000 base pairs apart, there is an issue. Since the distance is much larger than our, the, the size of our reads, we cannot inform both sites simultaneously and therefore have nothing informative to, that will help us do any phasing. While short reads are typically around 100 base pairs long, newer read technology, such as uh, PacBio and Nanopore, produce very long reads that are tens to hundreds of kilobases long. Delnez, who is speaking after me, will discuss some of our work with PacBio reads. But for here, we will focus on the third option, uh, linked reads instead. Standard next generation sequencing technology outputs short reads that are all independent from each other. Uh, and as mentioned previously, offer limited phasing capabilities. In contrast, linked reads operate by isolating individual long DNA molecules. Uniquely barcoded reads are generated from each strand of DNA. Since reads with the same barcode were derived from the same DNA molecule, we know that they share the same phase. 
This allows long distance phasing that is only limited by the size of the DNA molecules you can extract. Effectively, what we are doing is we are taking reads that would otherwise be independent and linking them together. So in this case, we know that both the C and the G are from the same uh, chromosome. Using 10x linked read technology, we have sequenced about 500 Canadians with cystic fibrosis, of which we included 358 in, in our analysis here. This required prospective recruitments of patients over the last three years to extract fresh blood samples from them. We sequenced samples at about 32x read depth, which leaves 25x usable data after trimming off the 10x barcodes. We experimented with DNA extraction techniques in order to ensure our data was of sufficient quality to phase well beyond the size of genes. On average, our molecular length, which is computed from 10 genomic software, was around 60 kb. The phasing power offered is well beyond 60 kb, though, as the median phase block size across our samples was 4.5 megabases. This is what is capable when haplotypic data is available. This is the TGT or poly T tract of CFTR that is known to impact splicing. Shown is a graph representation of a subset of our sequenced individuals. The nodes of the graph represent DNA sequence and the colored lines connecting nodes correspond to haplotypes observed directly through 10X genomics data. There are seven observed poly T alleles in this group of individuals denoted by the colors. The frequency of each is denoted by the thickness of the line. A person's complete haplotype can be reconstructed by stitching together the sequence observed by following a path through the graph. For example, we can see that the light blue line at the bottom there are, represents uh, multiple occurrences of a TGT, T9 uh, allele that are in phase with this downstream A allele on this SNP. We can zoom out further and see the phased haplotype variation for a much larger region. In this case, we're looking at approximately 300 kilobases. The entire 189 kilobase CFTR gene was phased in a single uninterrupted block for about 80% of our sequenced individuals with heterozygous CF causing variants. The next question motivated by our original zoom in plot was to understand the gap in the SNP data up here. We looked into the structure of the trypsinogen locus to better comprehend what is happening. The chromosome seven trypsinogen locus is composed of five, one, two, three, four, five duplicated genes that share about 91% base pair identity. Three of them, the three in the middle, are pseudogenes and are not believed to produce protein product. However, it is thought that PRSS 3P2, 3P2 is expressed uh, is transcribed, and this has been observed in our own analysis. The PRSS1 and PRSS2 genes, also known as cationic and anionic trypsinogen, produce the primary forms of trypsinogen found in the pancreas. When using sequencing data, we must choose a representation of this region to perform our analysis against. The primary sequence for two of the most commonly used human reference, gen reference genomes does not include all five genes. HG19 has a misassembly that completely removes PRSS2. HG38 is also missing two pseudogenes. However, this is because there is a common 20 kb deletion observed in about 40% of Europeans. While this, uh, while this representation is accurate for some individuals, other people will have a copy of PRSS2 or PRSS3P2 that will produce reads that should align to the pseudogene. If it is not present in the reference, it will often be spuriously aligned to the other similar trypsinogen genes in this region, which may produce misleading results. For instance, this issue has been documented in this recent publication where a consumer sequencing test reported the presence of a concerning variant known to cause hereditary pancreatitis. It was later determined that this was a false positive variant call uh, caused by erroneously aligned PRSS 3P2 reads aligned to PRSS1. To mitigate this issue, an alternative contig that includes all five uh, trypsinogen genes is available, and we use this as our reference sequence when analyzing this region. 
Here is a visualization of traditional next generation short reads at the trypsinogen locus. We have all five genes present here uh, using, because we're using the uh, reference sequence that I previously mentioned. The gray along the top shows the coverage at each base pair position. And this panel in the middle is uh, a stack of individual reads aligning to each position. The colors denote base pairs that are different from the reference sequence. And here is for the same individual, the 10X genomics linked reads uh, visualization. Using 10X genomics linked reads, we can split uh, the reads into their respective haplotypes. In this case, they are colored as yellow and purple and gray reads could not be assigned to either haplotype. It is not immediately evident when viewing the conventional reads that there is a large deletion present, which we can see on the yellow haplotype. With the tang Shi reads, we can clearly resolve this deletion and also phase it with respect to the flanking small variants in this, in this locus. It should be noted that if we chose the default HG38 reference, the reads that fall in this box would have nowhere to align because this segment is missing from HG38, um, and they would spuriously align to the other genes present here. We can phase our MI-associated SNPs with respect to the 20 kb deletion using 10x genomics reads. Here we show the top MI-associated SNP with RSID 3757377. The MI-risk allele T it's observed in our samples at a frequency of 40%. Likewise, the deletion is observed at 43%. This is for 716 haplotypes, which is two per person. We see the risk allele T is almost always found on the same haplotype as the deletion. And the C allele is almost found exclusively with the no deletion allele. If the deletion has a causal effect, this type of imperfect linkage could explain why the MIGWAS did not hit full genome, did not hit full genome-wide significance. The final question is, is, is with regards to how variation we observe may impact gene expression at this locus. Are there variants that alter gene expression? For which genes? What is the effect of the 20 kb deletion? To answer these questions, we need expression data. The Genotype Tissue Expression Project, or GTEx, includes expression data across 54 tissues. This enables tissue-specific expression analysis, as seen on the right here, where we can see tissues listed on the bottom and expression level on the y-axis. Um, and in th these two examples I extracted, we have PRSS1 and PRSS2, uh, which are clearly only expressed in the pancreas as expected. This data also allows identification of tissue-specific EQTLs. An EQTL is a type of variation that is associated with altered gene expression. Here in this toy example, we see a gene with a neighboring SNP. The T allele is associated with higher mRNA expression, and the A allele is associated with lower mRNA expression. In this case, we would call the TA allele uh, an EQTL. Any type of variation can be an EQTL though. For instance, the TA SNP could be instead the presence or absence of a large deletion. <laughs> using a statistical test, we may assign how significant each association is using p-values. When we look at the EQTL data made public by GTEx, we find that PRSS2 is the only gene in this locus with significant pancreas EQTLs. Surprisingly, this means that no variation was found by GTEx to significantly alter PRSS1 expression. For PRSS2, we can take the SNPs from our GWAS results, shown here from the zoom in plot, um, and overlay them with PRSS2 pancreas EQTLs. This plot was generated by a tool from our lab, Locus Focus, that is intended to overlap GWAS p values with EQTL data. The x axis here is the chromosome 7 coordinates with genes annotated. The GWAS EQTLs are plotted as purple dots, and the purple line is the best EQTL in a sliding window. The MI risk uh, SNPs are in color, and we can see the presence of two peaks in both the EQTL and uh, the MI association SNP data. 
This great colocalization of the two data sets suggests that MI risk could be mediated by PRSS2 expression. But what about PRSS1? It is strange that no significant EQTLs exist for PRSS1, as there are published examples of SNPs that alter PRSS1 expression. And additional, additionally, studies tend to focus on PRSS1, as it is believed to be the major form of uh, trypsinogen and uh, more relevant to diseases such as pancreatitis. Due to issues discussed about the locus structure that uh, previously mentioned, we decided to rerun the GTEx pipeline to our preferred reference. We also imputed the phase data and deletion calls from our 10x data into the GTEx variant calls. Since GTEx uses conventional short read data, uh, conventional short read sequencing, it is difficult to call the deletion directly. This resulted in a different outcome where we see significant EQTLs for both PRS1 or both. PRSS1 and PRSS2. The x-axis is the chromosome 7 coordinates. Trypsinogen uh, genes are annotated as these boxes, and the pseudogenes that are removed by the deletion are in pink. Variants are colored by their minor allele frequency. The top MI-associated SNPs are highlighted in orange, these two orange ones, and uh, the deletion EQTL is highlighted in red. Because the deletion was imputed, it likely has a slightly dampened p-value due to imputation error. Uh, interestingly, these two signals were shown to be independent. If we remove the effect of the deletion, we can see the PRSS1 signal is flattened and the PRSS2 signal remains. When we remove the effect of the significant PRSS2 SNP, um, the PRSS2 signal is killed and the PRSS1 signal remains. This indicates that the two signals are independent. Additionally, we can overlay the two uh, EQTLs on top of each other, PRSS1 being in orange and PRSS2 being in blue, and we can see they mimic the same structure in this region as our original MI association plot. We have shown evidence suggesting uh, that the common deletion haplotype affects PRSS1 expression, which coincides with the first associ association peak. There is also evidence that a second peak coincides with PRSS2 expression. We know that changes to PRSS1 and PRSS2 alter, risk, alter the risk of pancreatitis, which is often attributed to altered trypsin activity. Perhaps total trypsin activity or the ratio of PRSS1 to PRSS2 may alter MI risk in a similar way. Overall, we have covered three main topics motivated by our original zoom-in plot. Linked reads enabled access to phase haplotype information with respect to both small variants and the large deletion. Uh, the trypsinogen locus is complex, but linked reads can call the deletion, and the appropriate reference being used can mitigate a lot of these problems. And finally, we have identified independent signals that alter PRSS1 and PRSS2 expression and co-localize with MI risk, pointing to both genes as a source of potential altered MI risk. I want to thank the individuals involved in the Canadian CFG modifier study, uh, Lisa Strug and the rest of my lab mates, individuals from the CF Center at SickKids, uh, bioinformatics support from TCAG, as well as all the, the donors, Canadian CF patients and their families, and our funding sponsors. Uh, primarily, a lot of this work is funded by Genome Canada. Thank you for listening. Hello, I'm Dana Zoshando from Secrets Hospital, Toronto. And I will be talking about the novo assembly of long read sequence for the study of CF modifier genes. I have nothing to disclose. Progressive chronic lung disease causes majority of CF mortality and morbidity. It is a complex phenotype. Different CFTR mutations, environment, and gene modifiers all contribute its, it, to its variability. Family and twin studies have shown that half of the variation in CF lung function can be attributed to genetic modifiers. The largest metagenome-wide association study of CF, uh, CF lung function, identified five loci, including a locus on chromosome 5 around SLC983. Uh, here it shows the locus zoom plot of the region. Uh, so in the x-axis, we have chromosomal position, and the y-axis shows minus log 10 of the GVAS p-value. Uh, the colors are based on the linkage disequilibrium, or LD, between the SNPs and the top associated SNP here. 
As you see, we have a group of SNPs that are not in high LD with the top associated SNP, indicating that there are two independent signals in the region, which is confirmed by conditional analysis. None of the associated SNPs are coding, indicating that the causal variant or variants affect gene expression. Besides, both um, top uh, GWAS SNPs have been associated with gene expression in non-CF individuals. The region spans 280 KB and it includes five genes, AHRR, EXOC3, SLC9A3, CEP72, and TPPP. All of these genes, except for AHRR, are expressed in long epithelia. However, the best candidate is uh, SLC9A3, which has been associated with many CF-related uh, phenotypes, especially in intestine. Although it is expressed in long epithelia, but its role in long is not well known. Uh, what is specific about this region is that it includes a large number of variable number of tandem repeats or VNTRs, and it is also incredibly CPG rich, including 35 uh, CPG islands, which is much higher than the average on chromosome 5. VNTRs with repeat units greater than a uh, 6 base pair are a major source of genetic variation in humans. They impact gene expression and they are thought to contribute to missing heritability. They often span hundreds of base pair, which is challenging to a genotype with short read sequencing. Therefore, there is limited understanding of how they contribute to complex traits. CPG sites uh, are a region on DNA when, uh, where a, a C nucleotide or a cytosine nucleotide is followed by a guanine nucleotide along five prime to three prime uh, direction. And CPG islands are, uh, are uh, regions with high frequency of CPGs. The C nucleotide within CPG can be methylated to 5-methyl cytosine and methylation can change gene expression. Data from non-CF and nasal epithelia shows that uh, many of the CF long function GWAS SNPs are associated with uh, methylation at CPGs that in turn affect SLC9A3 expression. So here we hypothesize that the GWAS SNPs are tagging VNTRs that affect uh, long function in CF by altering gene expression. The study subjects were recruited into Canadian Cystic Fibrosis Gene Modifier Study, or CGMS, from 35 sites across Canada. We have packed bio long read sequence uh, in uh, 58 subjects, uh, where the average uh, length of their reads are 20 kb, and uh, we have uh, a 10x genomics or 10x G short linked read sequencing in a much larger sample size with 53 of them, uh, 53 subjects having data on both technologies. For the purpose of this project, we use 10XG as short read sequence. We also have nasal epithelia RNA sequencing in a subset of samples with four, uh, 46 of them also have pac bio, and six, uh, 68 of them also have 10XG data. So our study uh, had different steps. In the first step, we tried to identify the VNTR boundaries using pac bio long read phase sequence. Here it shows how the haplotypes were constructed in pac bio. Uh, the pipeline is developed by uh, Scott Master Matto, and it is available in his um, GitHub. Um, but in summary, first all pac bio reads for each person were aligned to the reference human genome 38. Then the reference is polished by uh, using all the reads so that we have a consensus sequence, uh, which is an average of the two haplotypes each person has. Uh, then long shot uh, was used to uh, put the reads into two piles corresponding the two haplotypes each person has. And then the consensus sequence uh, was polished using each of these piles separately so that at the end we had uh, two sequences uh, uh, according to the two haplotypes each person has. Um, in the next step, uh, we, uh, we multiple aligned human genome 38 and the two sequence uh, regarding the two haplotypes each person had uh, for all of the subjects at the same time. Um, most And most of the sequence uh, were uh, aligned uh, pretty well, except where we had like the VNTRs, where we have multiple gaps or misalignments. Uh, so this way we could identify where uh, these uh, VNTR, each VNTR is a start and ends. 
And by removing uh, all the gaps, we could also calculate the length of each VNTR on each haplotype for each person. This way, we identified 49 VNTRs in the region. Uh, all of these VNTRs, except three, included some CPGs, and 14 of them were overlapped with CPG islands. So in the next step, we tried to identify expression-mediating VNTRs or eVNTRs in CF nasal epithelia, indicating that may affect, they may affect uh, lung function. So here it shows the association of the VNTRs with gene expression in CF nasal epithelia. Uh, because, uh, because of multiple testing, the p-value significant threshold was set at 0 0.001. And from top to bottom, we have association of VNTRs with AHRR, EXOC3, SLC9A3, CEP72, and TPPP. The y-axis shows minus log 10 of the p-value and the horizontal line is a nominal significance. So we identified a VNTR, VNTR number 11, overlapping a CPG island associated with SLC9A3. Uh, it was also associated nominally with a, a exact tree expression. We also identified three VNTRs, 44, 45, and 48, associated with TPPP expression. These three VNTRs were also nominally associated with AHRR and SLC9A3 expression. The three VNTRs, 44, 45, and 48, were highly correlated. 44 and 48 included few CPGs, whereas 45 overlapped with the CPG island. So uh, we focus on VNTR number 45. So here it uh, shows the association of the two VNTRs, number 11 and 45, with SSC9A3 and TPPP expression. As you see, the two uh, VNTRs together explain 22% of variation in SSC9A3 expression and 6% of variation in TPPP expression in CF nasal epithelia. So this is uh, showing the association of the length of the VNTR with the gene expression. We also looked at the association of the number of CPGs within each VNTR and gene expression. And as you see, the um, associations become even uh, stronger. And the two VNTRs together explain 24% of variation in SLC9A3 expression. Here shows the association of the two uh, top G was the SNPs for 5' prime and 3' prime of the SLC9A3 with the uh, with the expression of SLC9A3 and TPPP. And as you see, the associations become less significant or even uh, not significant. And the two SNPs together explain 3% of variation in SLC9A3 expression and only 2% of variation in TPPP expression. VNTR number 45 is located in 3' prime UTR, UTR of TPPP. The repeat unit is about 35 base, uh, 31 base pair, and it includes one to four CPGs. Uh, this VNTR is tagged by the SNP from the GWAS Pick 5 prime of SLC9A3. Um, the VNTR can be categorized into short and long based on the length. And as you see, the short length of the VNTR, is, um, which is more frequent, is mostly on the same haplotype as the major allele of the SNP whereas the long length of the VNTR is mostly on the same haplotype as the minor allele of the SNP. And the R squared between the VNTR and the SNP is 0.65. VNTR number 11 is located in the last intron of SLC9A3. The, unit, uh, the repeat unit is about 100 base pair, and it includes a middle part, uh, which is missing in some repeat units. And uh, it includes seven CPGs. This VNTR is tagged by the SNP from GWAS pick 3 prime of the SLC9A3. And as you see, again, it can be categorized into short and long based on length. And the short version of the VNTR is less frequent and is mostly on the same haplotype as the minor allele of the SNP. Whereas the long length of the VNTR is mostly uh, on the same haplotype as the major allele of the SNP. And the R squared between the VNTR and the SNP is 0.53. So in the next step, we try to impute VNTR lengths in short-read sequencing. 
So here it shows a short read sequence where reads are aligned to the reference. Uh, and the dotted line shows, uh, shows where the VNTR is located. So the average sequencing depth is about 25. But when we come to the location of the VNTR, we see that we have piles of reads that align to the, align to the reference, uh, which is much higher than the average length of uh, average um, sequencing depth. So we hypothesize that we can estimate the length of the VNTR by dividing the number of reads aligned to the location of each VNTR by the average sequencing depth. And as you see in this table, the estimated length from 10x, uh, 10x short read sequence uh, is highly uh, associated with the average of uh, the um, average of the two haplotypes uh, from packed by all long read. So we use this method uh, to estimate the length of the two VNTRs in GTEx and uh, try to, to test the association of the two VNTRs with gene expression in um, in non-CF individuals across multiple tissues in GTEx. So as Scott mentioned, GTEx is a comprehensive public resource to study a tissue specific gene expression and regulation. And uh, it includes data from hundreds of individuals on uh, multiple non-disease tissues. Both a uh, short read whole genome sequence and RNA sequencing is available. So here it shows the association of the two VNTRs with SLC983 expression in multiple tissues from GTEx. And as you see, both VNTRs have been associated with SLC983 expression in multiple tissues in GTEx, including lung. The two VNTRs together explain 9% of variation in SLC983 expression in um, lung GTEx. But the two GWAS SNPs together explain only 2% of variation in SLC983 expression in uh, GTEx long. So, in conclusion, we identified two EVNTRs overlapping CPG islands tied by the top uh, SNPs from GWAS PICS 5' prime and G' prime of SLC983. The two EVNTR explain higher proportion of variation in gene expression than the two GWAS SNPs, suggesting that they are more likely to be the variants affecting gene expression. The two GWAS SNPs were associated with methylation at CPGs that in turn affect gene expression. And putting this together with the fact that the two VNTRs that we identified overlap CPG islands, and, this, and the number of CPGs within them were also associated with gene expression, all indicate that uh, the VNTRs may affect gene expression through uh, DNA methylation. We also provided a method to impute VNTR lengths in short read sequence. The two EVNTRs were also associated with gene expression across multiple GTEx tissues in non-CF individuals, suggesting that they can affect other phenotypes. Uh, I would like to thank all members of Canadian CF Gene Modifier Study, CFIT and the CF Center, uh, Canadian CF patients and families. I also would like uh, to thank Professor John, John Romans and uh, Professor Leyson for their advice and input throughout the project, and the TCAG members for performing all the sequencing, and uh, Dr. Saladin and his colleagues from University of Pittsburgh for providing nasal epithelia. Um, MQTL and EQTM data, uh, Genome Canada and CIHR for funding this project. And I also would like to thank Professor Lisa Strzok and all of my colleagues in Strzok Lab. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you everyone for those talks. I think they, they were very informative and I, I enjoyed all of them. We have some time for a question and answer now. Um, if you can please put your questions into the Slido, then we can uh, get started on those from here. Um, our first one, I think, is a general question. Uh, can you tell us what proportion of the CF registry population has no identifiable mutations? And what is the scope of that issue? I think that was a question that was originally posted while Dr. Adelar Exit was uh, speaking. Uh, yeah, I could answer that question. Um... Yeah, Dr. Uh, Karen May actually is the one who led the analysis on the uh, CFTR locus, and she actually uh, submitted a paper for publication that just got accepted um, at, in the Journal of Cystic Fibrosis. So that really details uh, the variants at CFTR and how many are known versus unknown. But um, 
about within the CF genome project, just under 1% of the individuals had um, less than two known CFTR variants, which is um, less than what is in the uh, CF registry. In the registry, about 3% of the individuals have uh, at least um, one unknown variant. Um, and one thing that we I, sh I can add uh, is that in the CF registry, we notice that sometimes they'll list two variants, but one of them will not necessarily be CF causing. So it will appear as if they have two variants, but uh, they actually aren't two CF causing variants. Um, other times we noticed that there were some inconsistencies where they list, were listed to have one variant, but when, you, when we looked at the data, that individual actually did not have that variant. So we did notice some, um, this is in a very small percent of individuals, but I just wanted to say that 3% um, in the registry being unresolved, we should also take with a little bit of a great grain of salt. salt. But yeah, I would highly recommend everyone to take a look at Karen Ray Ray's paper, who's, which is gonna come out soon. Great, thank you. So uh, I have a question now for Dr. Blue. Uh, the question is, can you please clarify? I believe you indicated that approximately 80% of patients in CFGP were homozygous for f 508 l yet you still found 371 variants with uh, about 273 of those being disease causing. Did these variants overlap with the f 508 l or how do those numbers stack up? Hi, great question. I'm actually going to point to Karen's paper again, um, because that explains that in a little bit more detail, but exactly right. We found sort of a bonus variants in people who are homozygous for the F508 allele. All right, I've got, um, let's see, two questions here for Dr. Knowles. Uh, so the first one is, um, from Ann Harris, very interesting talk for the 11P13 region. Do you think that the low p-value SNPs over APIP are functionally connected with the higher p-value SNPs in the middle of that region? Uh, great question, Ann. Um, this whole genome sequence uh, analysis has given us new sight, new insight into the locus at uh, chromosome 11. Namely, there are two independent groups of SNPs that associate with lung disease severity. Therefore, instead of having one SNP with perhaps two alleles, a risk allele and a non-risk allele, we now know that there are four uh, potential alleles. You have a risk and a, um, a risk allele and a protective allele. If you look at any one individual who happens to have all four, uh, all, both of their risk alleles, uh, all four alleles being risk alleles, they have much, much worse lung disease by the effect of the, the combination of the two variants there. So they, they're independent and we're working hard to see if we can figure out how they work independently. Great, thanks. The second part of her question is really more of a statement, but perhaps you can comment on it. Uh, there is a, she says, there is a topological domain boundary in the last intron of APIP and cis regulatory elements do not usually work across TADS. So there could be two different or two independent mechanisms in that region, one involving APIP and one EHF ELF5. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I couldn't agree more. <laughs> As I say, we think we're getting better insight into that region, which we've been banging our heads against the wall for five years. Great. I'll be communicating with Ann about that later. <laughs> Excellent. All right. I think we have another question for Dr. Axit. Um, were the PRSS1 variants found to be associated with uh, meconium ileus and CFRD risk pathogenic causative hereditary pancreatitis variants? or were they more so common polymorphisms in the gene not necessarily causative for pancreatitis? Um, yes, that's a great question. Uh, these variants were common variants surrounding um, the gene. Uh, so I, we can't say that they're causative for hereditary pancreatitis, but they do affect the expression of PRSS1 as also Scott explained in his um, talk. But, um, we did also check for the variants 
within PRSS1, the rare variants within PRSS1 that are known to cause uh, hereditary pancreatitis. So gain of function variants in PRSS1 will cause uh, hereditary pancreatitis. And we did have one individual with a gain of function, a known uh, pure, uh, pancreatitis causing uh, mutation in PRSS1 in our data set. Uh, but we didn't, uh, we were checking to see if that individual had, um, because it was just one individual, we couldn't really comment on how the effect was on CFRD or meconium ileus. Uh, we also had four individuals with loss of function uh, mutations in that um, in PRSS1, which should be protective against uh, pancreatitis. But again, since I guess it's these variants are very rare, it's hard to comment on what the, the impact of those variants on CFRD and MI are. Um, and yet yeah, the variants that we were talking about uh, that we identify are more common that just affect um, the expression of these genes and therefore um, slightly increased risk for chronic pancreatitis as well, but are not necessarily causative of hereditary pancreatitis. All right, thank you. Those are the questions that we have through the list. Are there any other questions or perhaps questions from our panelists about the uh, other talks? Well, I will invite everybody who's uh, listening that if you have additional questions, I'm sure you can feel free to email any of our presenters today and they'd be more than happy to share additional details about their research. And I uh, thank everyone for attending. Any final comments? Really quick, um, it looks like uh, Catherine Tuggle commented on the slides earlier that the website for, at the cff.org um, for requesting the CFGP data is live. So super excited. Um, let us know if you have any questions about that as well. Great, thanks for that addition, absolutely. Uh, for those of you who can't see it, it's, it's at cff.org and I think you can find it there through a search, so. Um, yeah, it lives underneath the research tools. Sorry. Research tools, excellent, thanks. Find more information there, yes. Any other comments or questions? All right, well, I thank everyone for joining us today and please reach out if there's anything else we can help clarify. All right. Thanks, uh, Becky and Lisa for uh, orchestrating this. Oh, that's- Yeah, thank you very much.